episode 286. Point of fact, if we're going to be candid, much of the problems that we face as an industry uh, of a poor reputation, it's because to a great extent, we as an industry have earned it by focusing solely on sales and sales alone to the almost to the exclusion of anything else. We have abused the trust of the people that bring us their vehicles. Welcome, aftermarketers, to Remarkable Results Radio. Listen to learn just one thing from today's episode on your journey to remarkable results. Welcome, aftermarketers throughout North America and around the world. Carm Capriato here with a passionate aftermarket professional that knows how to create customers for life. His name is Dutch Silverstein. This episode is supported by Federal Mogul Motor Parts and Garage Gurus for serious technical training and support online, on site, and on demand. Garage Gurus is everything you need to know. Find out more at fmgaragegurus.com. You know, listening to the podcast is the reward that goes to every aftermarket professional who has paid it forward and given of their time and wisdom to tell their story for you. Our beloved industry is made up of some of the best people in the world, and my job is to get their story told so that it'll inspire you in ways that make you, your family, and your team better, one implemented idea at a time. The network of connected listeners builds every week, and I'm honored to have new Facebook friends Kevin Hughes, Harlan Grizzle, and Glenn Todd. And my latest LinkedIn connections, Max Renzel, David Roman, and Richard Young. For all my social links, go to remarkableresults.biz slash social. Now meet Dutch Silverstein, a former airline pilot who, as he says, was gifted by a higher power to, number one, know how to fix things, and on number two, how to fly a plane. Well, he's the owner of A&M Auto Service in Pineville, North Carolina. Dutch has owned A&M for 19 years and is passionate about building customers for life. This episode has a strong continuing message of trust and integrity. If you have customers for life, Dutch's story will solidify your strategy. And if you don't have customers for life, Dutch's passion will help you understand how you can build a consumer into a customer and then into a client. To see an extended bio on Dutch, his shop's profile, and the cliff notes of our discussion, go to remarkableresults.biz slash e286. Here's an episode complete with many powerful strategies like customer education, the elimination of technician commissions, the important need to lift our industry's image and reputation, and that integrity and honesty is the only rule. If not, he says, please don't operate at all. One not to mince words. Now let's listen to Dutch Silverstein. Hey, warm welcome to Robert Dutch Silverstein, a and Auto Service in Pineville, North Carolina. Can I call you Dutch? Please do. All right. So, Dutch, you've said auto repair is a sacred trust, a life of service. When I was in my former career, people trusted you to take care of them. And they wanted to know that when they were going on their trips and they were going places, that somebody was going to look out for their best interest, that they wanted to arrive safely, hopefully on time, um, so that they can go on with their lives. Well, I brought that same ethos over to this business. I want to earn people's trust by providing a service that they can always count on. And sometimes that means that that service is not going to be putting money in my pocket. And there's nothing wrong with that. No, point of fact, um, if we're going to be candid, much of the problems that we face as an industry uh, of a poor reputation, it's because to a great extent, we as an industry have earned it by focusing solely on sales and sales alone to the almost to the exclusion of anything else. We have abused the trust of the people that bring us their vehicles. What can we do about it? Well, the first thing, if it was up to me, one, one day when they elect me king and things are going to change. Okay, well, that, you know, we'll work on that. We'll, we'll, we'll see what we can do. All right. <laughs> what I would do is I would eliminate the commission-based structure entirely. I don't want people to be motivated by the desire to line their pockets. I want them to be motivated by the desire to do the right thing. So here at A&M, we're the home of the no commission technician. Nobody in my facility is paid on commission. 
I won't have it. Service writer also? Service writer included, yes. Got it. And do you promote that fact? Um, only to those that ask when uh, new customers come in because I've had customers for a really long time and I call them clients because I've established a relationship with them. Typically, the first time they come in, have we seen you before? No. Can you come in about 10 minutes early? We ask them to get in 10 minutes early if they can so I can introduce them to everybody on the staff so they know who's working on their cars. They know Lish is at the front. They know my service writer, John, is there. I want them to start to feel a bond right away. I want them to meet people, to get used to seeing the same people there all the time. So when they ask, most of the time I direct them to the website on the telephone conversation or will tell them that unlike many facilities, if not most, there's no commission-based structure here at my facility. I won't allow it because there's, in my estimation, there's an inherent conflict of interest that exists between someone who is recommending a service and the needs of the individual who's going to be paying for it. It sounds like you're bringing insights to your customer and in, in you're, you're bringing down the barriers of knowledge transfer by the way you start with them. I do. From the very, very beginning, I stress education. From the very beginning, I want them to, to see, to be able to touch because people learn differently. Some people are visual learners. Some people, and for those people, for example, I have material literature in the lobby that they can reference. Some people understand more when they hear. Some people need to be able to put their hands on things when they see it. So for those people, I walk them over and I show them the tools and I ask them the question, is they, have they ever seen an alignment machine before? Do they understand how it works? Now, some people are not all interested. Let's be candid. Some people just want, I heard good things about you. I, I, you know, I'd love to say in chit chat, but I got to get out of here. And, and they're fine. And then when they come back, I tackle them again. You say they come back in two months and say, hey, you know, you never got my real tour here. Are you, are you ready? <laughs> no, I, I, I give it to them when they come back to pick up the car. Oh, okay. So, so you don't give up on them. I don't give up on them. The best reaction you've had from one of those great tours. Um, you can see them on, on my website for, um, or on the reviews uh, for Google, et cetera, is we take the time. He took the time to explain things to me. He shows me things. He answers my questions and doesn't make me feel like a dummy. This place, it's love. It's embracement. It's, it's caring. You're, you're, I guess people have said, if you want an honest answer, go see Dutch. That's what it's all about. There are two groups of people people that absolutely appreciate my straightforward candor and people who loathe it. So there's no, virtually no middle ground when it comes. You're either going to really appreciate what it is I'm doing or you're going to hate my guts. Why would somebody not appreciate your candor? Because they haven't prepared. They haven't prepared for a budget for repairs. They haven't, uh, they haven't maintained their car. You're going to give them some bad news. Right. If, if this is a new and initially they show up as consumers, right? They're a consumer that's heard about me. And from a consumer, you do the first transaction and they become from a consumer to a customer. Once you establish a relationship, then they become a client. So if they bring me a car that they've neglected, either because uh, they haven't been told all the issues, they haven't been advised, they haven't done their due diligence to check on consumer reports, they haven't done anything, I'm going to tell them, I'm going to break everything down for them so that they understand what they're going to be in for, or what they're likely going to be in for, for the next three, six, nine, 12 months. I got it. So they're angry because they're fearful. Yeah. I mean, th th that's the whole point. When, when you talk to somebody and they get angry at the counter, you have to understand the root of the anger is fear. You know, they, it's been said that, that the root of anger can be traced to fear, um, pain, and um, there was one other, I, I remembered, I, um, frustration, that was it. Fear, pain, and frustration. They're afraid that they're not going to be able to afford the repair. Mm -hmm. That's a genuine repair. That almost puts them in an embarrassing position, too. Right. Uh, and when we think about that, uh, and I, I did have this, and... You have to bear with me if, if this is not appropriate. I, I wanted to, to show you this because this here, I don't know if you can see it. This shows the savings rate 
in the country and how it's gone down. Oh, yeah, I see that. Okay. This is on the Peter G. Peterson Foundation. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things that they've shown is that the, um, they surveys 8,000 people across the, the country. And out of the 8,000 people, 57% had less than $1,000 in their savings account. So you can well imagine what would happen if you approach a service facility and someone says to you, you need X amount of dollars, and they're thinking their eyes get wide. And they get upset because they're afraid, because they're frustrated that they didn't perhaps listen to their previous service advisor, that the, their mother's voice rings in their mind. You, you got to put money back for a mm -hmm. rainy day. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The older we get, the smarter our parents get. Yeah. I discovered that, too. Is there any system that you employ in the business that helps people recognize what their commitment to, to maintenance and repair is? It's kind of a multifaceted approach. The first thing I do is I ask them, what are their plans for the car? Okay. Because the answers that you're going to get are going to be as varied as the number of people that, that, that come in. If someone says, for example, that, you know, I'm going to keep this car until the wheels fall off. And some of them do. Um, then we can say, okay, then this is what we need to do for maintenance that hasn't been done. We need to catch up on this. And then here is the following maintenance schedule. So if you're at 90,000 miles, at 100,000, it costs for this, at 110 or 105, whatever the maintenance schedule of that particular vehicle has to be so that they can know and that they can start the budget. If someone says, look, it's December. I just want to get through the next two months because I'm going to be getting a car when after the new models come out and they're running some sales and they're doing, okay, that's great. Well, let's focus on the safety related items that we have to be able to take care of for you now. Cause my primary focus at the airline was on safety. So it remains today. Let's take care of the safety related items. And then from there, if you happen to have the car after that period of time, when you come back for the next service, we can address the other things. How does that sound? And most people really understand and go for that. There are people that you say, here's the truth. You've got 218,000 miles on this car. Um, when you leave here today, I want you to go home, go to church, light a candle on your way back from church, go to the lottery, to the store and pick up a lottery ticket because you won. You're never going to get this kind of mileage on it. And to, to fix this car really would be a waste of your money. Okay. I mean, if it's a safety related issue, um, and you're going to keep it for a little while, for, for, you know, a couple of months, that's fine. But aside from that, please don't put any more money in this car. I'm talking with Jonathan Cicchelli, a technical product specialist with Federal Mogul Motor Parts. Now, you're visiting shops every day. So when you put product in the hands of the technicians and service advisors, what are they saying? Uh, going back to Federal Mogul's long-term um, presence in the, in the industry, they already know the product. And some of them we don't have to say much about. It's the newer product, the latest innovations that we come out with that just blow people away. So, Jonathan, you take that brand new OEX pad and you put it into the hands of a technician. What happens? They look at it and are kind of speechless for a couple seconds. And they just can't deny that it's an awesome looking product. And they can't deny that it's going to work fantastic on their vehicles. Now, another phenomenal product line that is just one of the most iconic brands in the entire industry is Moog. Now, there's a lot going on with Moog. The newest thing with Moog is going to be, I think, the most important thing to the shops is the newer design ball joint that we created. And that was off of technicians' responses to a boot design. That's that compression-loaded ball joint with the pre-installed integral dust boot? Absolutely. And as soon as I pull that out of a box and show a technician or a shop owner, they just were like, this is amazing. So, Jonathan, would you say that you're a champion for Federal Mogul Motor Parts and all the premium products? Absolutely. And a champion for all the training. I'm, I'm very big on training. I've always been in training since I've been in the professional field. So just to come back and support on the other end has just been an awesome experience. Federal Mogul Motor Parts' Garage Gurus is your go-to source for the vehicle training, technology, and answers you need to keep your next job on track. On site, online, or on demand, the gurus are here to help keep your business and your career on the road to success. Visit fmgarageguru.com. You know, Dutch, you love helping people in a non-pressure environment. You almost like, you know, you just 
take it take it away is this your just your god-given natural way that you are did you learn this along the way i i learned it along the way because i started to understand one day many many years ago my sister called me up and she was in tears now she lives in um several hundred miles away from here and she told me that the she was at the dealer and she always had her service work done at the dealer. Whatever they recommended, she did because she knew how I was with safety and she didn't want to compromise. And I couldn't do it for her because I was, you know, 10 hours away. And she was in tears because they said that she, if she didn't fix her CV axles in her car, uh, she was going to get into an accident and die or she could kill somebody. What? I mean, that is serious. If you're telling somebody that if you don't get this done today, you could leave here and kill somebody, that's serious stuff. There's the commission guy. There's the guy that's put under pressure. So what I did was I said, put the service writer on the phone. And I began to talk to him. And when he found out that I owned a shop, when he found out that he was starting, I was starting to answer, uh, I was asking him questions that he was having difficulty answering. He then said, oh, wait, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. This wasn't Stephanie's car. That was my sister. This was another car. You, you, your sister just has spider webbing on, on her boots for the joints. If I could have magically transported myself up there to beat the crap out of him, I would have. Because here is, a, a, she's a grown woman who is scared to leave the facility. And unfortunately, Tactics like that exist. I'm not saying that anybody that's in, in the group that watches this would do those things, but there are pressures that are put on because we're focused so much on the sales, on the immediate gratification of getting the sale right now that we forget that we're providing a service, that people rely on us because this is the vehicle that they're going to take to get to work. Maybe this is the vehicle that they're going to go to their child's graduation in. Maybe this is the vehicle that they're going to take their dog for the last ride to the vet in. Maybe this is the vehicle that they proposed to their wife. And that, you know, after they first, they came back in, this means something to Americans. We still have, although not as much as we used to, we still have a love affair with cars. Yes. Connection to cars. And you, you get that people's side and, and you're almost saying, this is the place where all of that comes alive again. There are some people, there's a small group of people who just look at a car as a machine. It's a means of conveyance. And what they want to make sure of is, is it safe so that it can properly take me from point A to point B without any problem? That's fine. They have no emotional attachment. For, for many people, though, the car is more than just a means of conveyance. Yeah, but Dutch, what, what happened along the way? The, our love affair of cars is kind of dwindled uh, they all look look alike they're the same they're they're commodities uh, I guess we, we see a car commercial four times in a half hour if you watch the news and it's almost like you can guess who's going to be next where are we up, upstairs with that we don't have the car culture in many respects now some of the younger people have those with Asian cars um, we've lost I th it's a generational issue it used to be that when I was a kid, I used to love uh, riding with my dad, and I could tell from the lights that were on the car behind me what kind of car it was, and we used to play a game. Yes. I still do. Right. But right now, um, so many of the vehicles look the same. They're just blobs. There's no style. There's very little grace. What do you think the new generation loves, if there is going to be a love factor for cars, what do you think they love about cars today? Just the, the tech in the center stack? Yeah, th that's what they want. Because ultimately, that love affair, aside from the tech, really, for the most part, that I can see in my experience, really doesn't exist. What was your first car, man? 68 Pontiac Le Mans two-tone, blue and rust. Oh, mine was a 71 Camaro Rally Sport. Man, did I feel bad <laughs> behind that wheel. <laughs> Yeah, the, the, there were some things that uh, that I did in that car which really defied description because I, I I shouldn't be here. I mean, when you're young and you're you're driving and you're invincible, 
You know, there's some stuff that I was doing on the Palisades Interstate Parkway with that car that really could probably still get me in trouble. I'm invincible. I love it. So you love fixing cars that other people can't. Yeah, I absolutely believe. And this is not I'm not promoting religion or anything else, but I absolutely believe that in uh, in his infinite wisdom, the creator gives everybody, every human being, every one of God's children gifts. Some people it's a gift for music. Some people it's athletics. Some people it's language or understanding mathematics or art or science. Somebody has something that they have an affinity for that they're good at. I only had two things in my life that I was good at, just two, uh, when it comes to understanding things that were mechanical and piloting an aircraft. That was it. I am the world's worst athlete. If it came down to it, you would take, and this is not in any way demeaning, but you would take uh, a younger person perhaps in a wheelchair before you would pick me. And then if you had to pick me, you'd want like a few runs to start because I'm miserable at it. I'm, I'm just not. So, so how was middle school when you were, you were all on the ball diamond and they were going around picking teams? Yeah. The, the, uh, <laughs> you never, you just uh, never went to the, ball I, diamond. I, I, you know, it's, it's, it's how I failed Jim. And my, my father <laughs> said to me at the time, how can you fail Jim? All you have to do is show up. And I went, uh, uh-huh. <laughs> you know, um, so <laughs> I, I just didn't go. Funny, funny, funny. So you love diagnostics. You just love, I mean, so you were born to do this. I think that's one of the gifts ever since I can remember I was taking stuff apart. It didn't always make my father happy, but I always took stuff apart because I wanted to understand how things work. Did you ever take a toaster apart? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's not a problem. Piece of cake, huh? What was your most complicated item as a kid you took apart? Well, the first one that I recall is I took a, a, a phonograph apart. And this was the old record player. Yeah. I, I, I took that back uh, apart. Um, reassembly, however, was not my strong suit at that time. <laughs> <laughs> many, many years later, after my parents found out that I had th- this skill, I decided to change the oil on that 68 Pontiac Le Mans. Okay. Now, this was before I could drive it legally. Um, and that's why I learned the value of a good tool. Because I used an oil filter wrench, and I put it on the oil filter, and I prompt, and I got it. It was like a dollar, and I promptly crushed the oil filter. Not a problem. I'm smart. I can, yeah, no. The car had to be towed. I put the screwdriver through the oil filter and, and turned it off like that, but it wouldn't come up. It just peeled like the old sardine can. Oh, with the key. Yeah. So now I have the mounting plate that's up to the oil filter mounting boss. And it can, so my father had it towed to the service station where the, they took it off. And he told me that was the most expensive oil change he's ever had in his life. And I bet you there's a ton of people listening to this saying, been there, done that. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So you were an airline pilot for how many years? I was with the company that, um, uh, for over 20, I was in aviation since um, 1975. So when you decided to get out, I mean, the first thing you thought of was to become uh, a, either a technician or a business owner? Um, no, actually, I didn't decide to get out. When I was um, in college, I was uh, attending college, and I noticed there was a nice fellow there that was repairing pinball machines. And so, you know, I'm friendly. I'll talk to anybody, really. And I started talking to him and I found out that because I wanted to see, could you make a living fixing pinball machines, going to college campuses? And he said, oh, no, son, this isn't what I do full time. I said, well, what do you do? And he reaches into his pocket and he was uh, a 727 captain for Eastern Airlines. And that kind of floored me because why was an Eastern Airlines 727 captain who was at that time earning what was equivalent to a Cadillac a month in pay? Why was he fixing pinball machines? Shouldn't he be out playing golf, be on a boat somewhere doing something? So I said to him, hey, listen, it's none of my business, but why are you fixing pinball machines when you should be doing something else? And he turned to me and he said something I've never forgotten. He said, son, in this business, you better have a backup. Now, I didn't know what he meant because, you know, you're young, you're in college, an old guy is talking to you who is younger than I am now. But, um, and, you know, it just kind of, he was old, he was ancient, <laughs> you know. Um, and that kind of stuck with me. I didn't, I, but I didn't, I didn't focus on it. Fast forward many, many years later, I, I, it's uh, like 1989, and I buy my house and I'm still in uniform, came off of a trip, and I go to Sears 
and I go to buy a lawnmower. And while I'm in uniform, the salesman there starts talking to me and he's asking me questions. And it's obvious to me that the questions that he's asking are industry specific. The average lay person would never know to ask these questions because of the terminology that he was using. And I said, I don't mean to pry, but how is it you know so much about my chosen profession? And he was a captain for Eastern Airlines. He showed me his type rating. And when the airline went out of business, he lost everything he had and now had to sell lawnmowers and Sears to provide for his family. Message number two. Reinforced, the first one came right back and said, son, in this business, you better have a backup. So I became consumed with finding my backup plan. And since I had worked through high school and into college using my hands and my head to earn money because that's how I paid for school. Um, I just decided that that would be something that I would do. And I started my business part time renting a bay from a friend of mine who had a shop and he sublet the bay to me so that I could do it because aviation is incredibly cyclical when things are good. Everybody moves up in rank, pay increases, everybody's happy. When things go bad, when the economy turns south, people start getting laid off and you start moving backwards. And what happened to me was the company that I was working for declared bankruptcy twice in a two-year period and my retirement vanished. And then soon thereafter, um, there was a medical issue where they thought I had leukemia. And when that happened, the FAA revoked my medical certificate. And because of that, because of the chemotherapy that they put you on, um, they, they're kind of funny, the FAA. They, they don't really like you being able to, you know, not concentrate on final approach. This whole wanting to nod off stuff. <laughs> well, what, what, what an interesting story that prepared you for where you are today. So your business acumen, where, where did it come from? I, I know you read the E-Myth. Did that in any way help you to where you are today? Yeah, I mean, the E-Myth was, was really good. I, I did study business in college, but candidly, that didn't prepare me. What prepared me was making a, a crap ton of mistakes. I mean, I made a lot of mistakes. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, they say experience is, is the best teacher. Well, in, in my case, being as hard-headed as I, as I was, um, I made a, a really some really expensive mistakes. And then I said, you know, there's got to be a better way of doing it. So I started to seek out coaches and I started to go through the training that would enable me to, um, I knew that training would work for me as a technician because I'd always done it. I was a systems junkie. So I went to every technical training that was ever around. Um, I've got a stack of, you know, it's, it's got to be four inches high of, of certificates from attending training, but I had never gone through the business training. So I thought, okay. Let me pursue that. And I, I sought out several coaches. There are a number of weekend seminars. They call them boot camps and introductories. And you know, so I, I went and did that. I did some stuff online. Um, that's what I did. And you never regret uh, working with a coach. That's a very, very difficult thing to say because one of the things in the grand scheme of things, in retrospect, there were some coaches that I should have listened to my gut and not got involved with. However, that was valuable to me because it taught me what wouldn't work for me and it addressed a limit for me. But the ones that did help you, um, very much worth your investment of time and money? Without question. Got it. Without question. Would you recommend to a struggling or a young uh, shop owner, service professional to, to, to look into coaching? I would. And um, the toughest thing, is that you don't know as a young shop owner what it is you don't know. And because you don't know what it is you don't know, you don't, want, don't know what questions to ask to get the answers that can help you choose the right path towards the right coach for you. What I've done is uh, I've put together and, and I have it a questionnaire that I'm going to be posting to a Facebook group, a shop owner's Facebook group. And it's, it's pretty long um, so that if any person who's a shop owner or anyone who's potentially a shop owner thinks, Hey, I, I think I need help. 
what questions should I ask? We've got a series on the podcast archives, um, business coaches. I've interviewed a lot of them, and um, I, I've um, so enjoyed talking to the business coaches and getting their perspective on things. And yes, they they all have a different attack on on solving problems. So, what did you learn from the E Myth? What was a big takeaway for you? Systems. You know, it reinforced that the airline. I had systems for everything. We used to say. Um, <laughs> I can't really repeat it in mixed company, but you didn't do something without a checklist at, at, the, at the, the airline. And what I found is that in our business, standardization and checklists really didn't exist. They existed if you went with a franchise because a franchise worked on repeatability. But the independent business owner, the shop that wanted to remain independent without going the franchise route, really didn't have any. He had or she had to do it by trial and error. And oftentimes it wasn't until they got burned that they said, you know, I, I got to write this down because if I write this down. This will make sure this doesn't happen to me again. And I'll distribute that amongst the employees. So that's what I learned. I learned that standardization, even in this industry, is paramount. Congrats on getting your AAM from AMI. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I got the plaque on the wall. Yeah, I saw me. that yeah. behind you there. Um, how long did it take you? Uh, it took me a few years um, because I did it on again, off again. Mm -hmm. um, and, but I'll be getting, I'm going to complete, um, I've signed up and I'm, for my master's. Very good. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get that as well. Have you ever traveled up to Vision? Mm -mm. No? Okay. No, I, I don't leave the shop. I don't have a life. <laughs> I understand. Uh, why do you do all this, Dutch? I have a handicapped son. And in order to be able to provide for him an income that will carry him through the remainder of his years, I have to make the sacrifice today for the blessings of tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So because of that, because he'll never be able to take care of himself, uh, I'm doing what's necessary to do that by building a, a business that can be sold to make up for both my retirement and have money put back for him in trust. Uh, professionally, I want to do it because I want to see the profession improve. We have a miserable reputation as a general, as an industry. The general public has virtually no idea what we do. They have no idea what it takes to do what we do. I really want people to understand that while nothing in happens in business without a sale, you always have to make a sale. You can have the best equipment, best employees, best facility, best of everything. Unless and until you make a sale, nothing happens. But it's how you make that sale. Are you making it for the long term or are you making it for the short term? And if all you want to do is pack your schedule for the short term, you can make money fast. But it's at a cost. And your integrity is going to suffer because of it. That's just the way that it is. So what do we got to do as an industry? There's got to be um, a silver thread or, or something out there that you know, catches fire and starts making some grassroots changes. Do you, have you ever thought that through? Yeah, the, the problem is that it's going to take the one thing that no one wants to utilize. It's two things, really. The first is money, and the second is sacrifice. Because in order to educate the public about what it is that we wind up doing, about the training that it took, the technical training, the, the equipment that it takes, everything that it takes, there has to be a PR campaign. And it has to be robust. And then it should require, in, insofar as I'm concerned, Every shop should be contributing towards this so that it goes in newspapers, it goes online. Because, again, people, in their mind, the paradigm that's been set is of the greasy mechanic of, you know, basically it's Goober, right? And Gomer from, from Goober and Andy Gomer. Griffin. Yeah. yeah. You know, and that's flat out wrong. You're not doing CAN bus issues now. You're not taking care of them if you're a dummy. And we have to start, and Mike Rowe, in my opinion, is doing a great uh, service to people when he says, look, college is not the pathway for everybody. It doesn't have to be. And we need to focus on that, about the fact that being a technician, being a shop owner, being it's not a consolation prize. 
oh, well, you could have gone to college, but you weren't good enough, so you wound up doing this. If every technician in this country were to simply say, I'm not going to work tomorrow, or we're not going to do anything, and the owners would never suffer, this country would come to a grinding halt. So that's the first thing. So that the first, again, is money. And then the, the second is we as an industry have to be willing um, to sacrifice initial, some initial monetary gains for the long term. We have to become what, in my estimation, Hyundai did. Do you remember years back um, in the 80s when Hyundai came in with the Hyundai Excel? Do you remember that vehicle? Yes, I do. Yeah, that was a huge pile of crap. And anybody who was around at that time knew that it was. Yes, it was. But Hyundai had an idea. and They were in for a 25-year plan. And it was published at the time, et cetera. And they knew that they would build upon, build upon, build upon quality and look where they are. Well, it's the same thing with my business. I started my business part-time by myself, went full-time with just me, just me and a helper. And then I've continued to grow. So. You know, now I have a service writer, I have a receptionist, um, I had three techs, I'm going to get another tech. So it takes time, but you have to do it for the long term. That monetary sacrifice, are you saying, hey, basically, let's, let's no commission, let, we can't sell um, like we used to. We need to sell with integrity and honesty and trust. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're exactly right. Let, let me ask you this, and this, this is a difficult question for those that are watching. Suppose one of your customers comes in and they think that they need, because they tell you, because their brother-in-law is a mechanic and, you know, whatever, that they need an alternator, okay? And you listen to it and you find out, no, and they authorize the repair of the alternator. I know it's the alternator. Put the alternator on. Don't worry about it. Take it. And you go and you find it's not the alternator. It's the idler pulley that's right next to it. There are shops that would say, this is a grown adult who asked us to replace the alternator. We're going to replace the alternator. And while we're there, we'll also replace the idler pulley. That exists in our industry. In our industry, we have people who have cars that come in and items are covered by recalls. But instead of sending them to the dealer, they do the work themselves and charge the customer. That happens. And it happens more frequently than people are willing to admit. So if you're not integrity driven, because ultimately I, I read in one of the magazines, it was um, a case where a fellow who was an automotive writer had an exhaust problem in his Volvo. In this um, example, he went to a shop and the replacement was $700. But the owner of the shop said, wait a minute. I can section this bad rusted section out and I can weld in a bridge. Okay. So now this will be the new part that's right here and the rest of it's going to be the original, but that's going to save you a tremendous amount of money. Now, depending on who you talk to, that owner shot himself in the foot, not the vehicle owner, but the business owner, because he had the, he had the opportunity for a $700 repair that the customer was willing to pay for because he could see and hear that the exhaust was bad, or he could charge him an hour and it's a small section of exhaust tubing and have a customer for life. Which would you rather be, Carm? What do you want to do? A million thoughts going through my head right now as to what decision that I would make. I think what you're telling me is the decisions need to be made for customer for life. Customer for life. And you, you have to understand and you have to realize you will never, ever, ever, ever make everybody happy. It's simply not going to happen. And you're going to give your best effort sometimes and you're going to fall smack on your face. Diagnostics or testing? A diagnosis is something that you wind up with after you perform the testing. Got it. I love your diagnostic time calculator. And did I see you present it? I think I may have. And 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 I know I I have a um, I have it in front of me. And I would instead of going through all the math and everything, just share with our listeners the the concept of if you're going to set a diagnostic labor rate, how you have to make up for the parts margin. Sure, because 
when you think about it, every time you sell an hour, we're just going to use a job that's going to take an hour, whatever that job may be. You're going to be selling parts during that hour, right? Okay. So you're going to make a profit on the labor and you're going to make a profit on the parts. When you don't have parts to sell, you have to raise your rate to cover the loss of revenue because you're not selling a part. If you use the industry 50-50, which was for the benchmarks for years, what you would do is you would say, okay, I'm at $100 an hour. I'm making up a round figure. That's all. And I would have $100 in labor and $100 in parts for which at 50%. So I'm looking at um, $150 to me. So now you don't have the part. You just charge 150 bucks For the first initial evaluation, which we have here, the first initial evaluation um, is going to be about $103 plus tax. It's $118. And the tech has to accomplish that in half an hour, in 30 minutes. And that way we've offset the amount that we, because if he takes a full hour to do it, if we do quote unquote diag all day, we're going broke. Without, without having the, the bump or as you, as you call it, the diagnostic recapture factor. I believe many, many coaches teach this, and, and if not, it's, it's easy to find out. But that's one of the hurt, hurt, hurting problems that exists in, in shops today is that they're, they're not getting paid for it. That's the difference many shop owners don't understand because the public certainly does not understand that there's a difference between your posted labor rate and your effective labor rate. They won't let you, <laughs> almost. And then that's another story about, you know, giving, giving the stuff. Ultimately, when it comes down to it, if you give your services away so that you can't pay your bills, so that you can't take care of your family, so that you can't take care of the employees that are depend on you. I carry the weight of every employee that I have. No difference than I carried the weight of the passengers that was on my airplane. I'm responsible for them. So that means that I have to charge for it. I have to be compensated fairly for the efforts, the training, the experience that went into repairing that vehicle or servicing it in the event that it doesn't need repair. It just needs maintenance. I've learned so much. I've uh, met myself a brand new great friend. Thank you for being here, Dutch. Before we leave, any great words of wisdom you'd love to share? Take care of one another. Treat people like you'd want them to treat your mom. That's it. Would you want your wife going into a place um, and having somebody trying to shoot her the grease? Would you want your doctor doing that to you? Would you want your dentist trying to upsell you something that you don't need or could do without because they're trying to make a boat payment? Treat each other with respect. If you do that, respect is earned. It's not bestowed. People will come back. And they'll believe you and they'll put up with your eccentric personality like they put up with mine. No. Because ultimately, oh yeah, I'm a wackadoodle when it comes to a lot of stuff. Ultimately, people will believe that you're looking out. Become an advocate for them. You worry about their car. Tell them, let me worry about your car so you don't have to. And I'm not going to do anything to your car that I wouldn't do to mine or my wife's. And if I think the car is not going to be safe, I'll tow it back to your house for you free of charge if you can't afford to fix it because I don't want you driving it. Believe in doing the right thing. It has to be the right thing. Thanks for those great wise words. Well spoken. Thanks. Robert Dutch Silverstein from a and Auto Service in Pineville, North Carolina. Thanks for being on the show, man. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Dutch. We're on the same page, and thanks for sharing your story and your passion. For a list of episode talking points, bio information, and the shop profile, see the show notes at remarkableresults.biz slash E286. And don't forget to check out the Town Hall Academy Single Subject Roundtable Series. Find this very powerful aftermarket resource at remarkableresults.biz slash academy. Your learning curve never sounded so good. Hey, if you need to get in touch, email me, carm at remarkableresults.biz, that's B-I-Z, and also share the love on social media. Now go and share this episode with someone who can value this story. Thanks for being on board to listen and learn from the premier automotive aftermarket podcast. Until next time.